Hi everyone, this is Erin and your Library Insight Technology Facilitator here to um, give a recording of a presentation that I did for our professional development on January 4th, 2021 as we were moving from first semester to second semester of uh, distance learning and you know kind of giving a little update uh, in August 2021 as we move into a new semester and teachers are setting up their Google Classrooms, okay? Uh, the objectives and agenda of this presentation is to discover techniques for using Google Classroom more effectively with our students and setting up Google Classrooms, this thing says, for spring 2021 semester, but of course this is recaps, you know, or a review update. So this will be for the fall 2021 semester. And um, everything that's being shown here is coming from teachers at an administration uh, people like me at Glen Oaks High School. So this presentation was made after several key people who had a lot to do with technology at all levels sat down at the end of the fall 2020 semester and said what was working and what wasn't. Now that we were in distance learning, we were all in Google Classroom. What did we need to do to make it work better? And I know that currently we're in a face-to-face -face situation, so it might seem like why do we need to do this stuff? But to be honest with you, they kind of work in both situations. And certainly if, you know, knock on wood, you know, we had to pivot ourselves into, you know, a hybrid situation or something of that nature, having your room already set up, prepped for that situation can only be a benefit uh, for both you and your students in that transition. So at the end of fall of 2020, as we all sat back and thought about, you know, what had gone right, wrong, et cetera, in the fall semester, Everything that this little group of people, you know, discussed tended to fall into four categories. So sorry that my little, you know, face is covering up um, using a program where that shows up. But uh, it tended to fall into time confusion, communication, prioritizing, and technology. So time confusion. We had a lot of students who didn't really know our bell schedule. And they, you know, they're, they're used to the bell ringing and everybody getting up and moving. But if you asked them what time that was, they had no clue. And, you know, things like deadlines, that became another issue. So issues with time, communication, obviously in a virtual world, things were shifting all the time. Uh, that communication, even in face-to-face, -face, you know, a lot of our kids are taking Chromebooks home. So they still need to be able to effectively understand what's going on in a digital world. Prioritizing. We had a lot of issues with um, students focusing maybe on stuff from a previous semester that didn't really count anymore as far as towards their grade. We had issues with, you know, if I have, you know, it's down to the wire and I have two assignments, which one should I focus on? Things of that nature. And of course, technology just in general, everybody had a steep learning curve that semester and, you know, last semester as well. So, you know, students were struggling with attaching assignments, hitting the turn in button, et cetera. Teachers were struggling with how to best put it all together and, you know, do it quickly, sometimes in a moment's notice. So our issues fell into these four categories. So anytime I talk about something in this presentation, it will relate back to at least one of these categories or else it's not being presented. No matter what, um, please remember that your Google Classroom, you should be working it in tandem with a program called GoGuardian, which is for monitoring our children. Um, it is a monitoring system in the virtual world, so you can see what's going on in the Chromebook. I already have mine completely set up for this um, fall 2021 semester. I am a big Go Guardian person. If you need help, I am a Go Guardian champion. Uh, you can take a little course through Go Guardian. It takes about an hour and you can be a champion too. And um, it'll teach you all the things you need to know. But some of the benefits of Go Guardian, it has individual student teacher chat features so that you can communicate with them immediately, which many teachers found helpful in the face-to-face -face world for privacy and certainly was a benefit in the virtual world. Uh, you can lock Chromebooks then when they're off task. I, I'm kind of famous for it. I can include a message. Please put your eyes up. You know, I asked you to open up this tab. You can lock it, unlock it, etc. Um, timeline of everything that does. I hate that my picture's in front of this, but you have a timeline of when they're on task, off task, which video that, you know, they were watching, etc. Extremely helpful for documentation. You can create scenes of what they can and cannot do on their Chromebook. So I already have scenes for my survey of computer science course that's blocking like 60, 60 something websites for games and things of that nature, things that will keep them off task. And, um, you know, there's a lot of benefits. There's a lot of management that can be done well with GoGuardian when it's working in tandem with, you know, your classrooms. And that can be synced with Google, 
Google Classroom. So please make sure. If you need help with that, please let you know reach out to one of us who knows and set that up. Uh, only thing to remember, it only works with Chromebooks, not other devices. So some of the students picked up on the fact that if they use their laptops, we couldn't control them like we could on a Chromebook. But this is one of the reasons you need to gently uh, guide them to the Chromebook. Uh, a lot of people, I, I and several of us eventually pretty much told them we were only communicating with them through GoGuardian, which was getting them back in their Chromebooks so we could see them like in the, you know, when we were in the virtual world during the class period and it kept everything in one place and also got them on the Chromebooks, you know, and not on things where we couldn't see what they were doing. Best practices for setting up the Google Classroom. So that's the point everyone's at right now. Um, first thing is setting up your personal Google Classroom settings. So a lot of you stated you were drowning in emails from Google Classroom. You were getting a notification for everything. This was especially true for our ESS teachers who were in multiple classrooms or for people like me who are like in a, you know, 25 people's classrooms. Uh, you can check your personal settings to see if they're what you run. Remember that it tends to be kind of an all or nothing thing. You can't just say for certain students and stuff, you have to say all or nothing for a class. But what would that mean? So when you go to the Google Classroom and you scroll to the bottom, um, if you scroll all the way to the bottom and you see all the squares for all your different classrooms, you'll see archive classes, but underneath it, you'll see settings, and this will help with your communication. Obviously, your email won't flood as much. And um, set it to what you want. I can't tell you what that is, but set it to what you want it to be. Please remember, we just talked about archiving. So please make sure um, you're archiving. Anything you had last semester that's not currently being used needs to be archived. We don't need kids going into classrooms that aren't being monitored. We are legally responsible for what they do. So if you allowed them to communicate, you gave them a district communication platform and you are legally responsible for that. You need to close that if you're not actively monitoring it. Okay, so from last spring, um, please do that. This summer, two years ago, it's still sitting there open. They can still get in. But I will say that it is considered a best practice to also archive at the end of each grading cycle. So we're on a nine week grading cycle. I've already set mine up. I haven't populated them with kids, but mine are set up for uh, the first, second, third, and fourth nine weeks. Um, I just copied them. Uh, this prevents students from having a virtual place to meet on the side. We are legally responsible, I mentioned that. But it also prevents students from wasting time trying to work on old assignments. So I ran into multiple parents last year who would say things like, he's just gonna do every assignment. And the kids yell at mama, that's from last nine weeks. It doesn't even count anymore. And now you've got a tip for tap that you've allowed it out there and mama saying, do everything. Um, another reason to archive is just eventually you have too much stuff in your Google Classroom and you're scrolling, 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 and nobody can find anything. So it is considered a best practice that at, at the end of a uh, grading marking period, after you know everything's done, you set up another one, we invite again. So something to consider for this fall and the spring. So if you want archive, it's very simple. You go to the, um, the square, you go to the three little dots and you archive. And um, this is another thing about prioritizing besides, you know, my little face here is covering it, besides keeping us, you know, clear with some legal issues. If the kids can't see as many classrooms, they only go to the ones they need to go to. Let's not confuse them. Uh, number three, Google Classroom banner. So the banner is the top part. You can change it, you know, get a little design and stuff like that. Uh, Google has a pre setup of, you know, suggestions of what to go on each line. We actually adapted that last year. Mine is set up that way for this year. So in the ideal world with them virtual, we found that probably the first line is your class name line. So include the class period and the course title, um, the period and the course title. We had a lot of issues last year, which will be alleviated this year because everybody's on the same schedule, but was a class period 4B or was it eight? That caused problems. Thankfully, we're all on the same schedule, so that won't be a problem this year. But you know, the course title and the class period on the first line. On the line that when Google tells you a section, we found it worked better to put the specific time that the course meets and your name. Um, we thought they were looking on the website for the bell schedule and things like that. They were not. Um, and if they didn't know it, they didn't know when to come to your class. And they, they used that as soon as they were just sitting there. I, I caught on when I had a seventh grader who asked me the question, mama wants to know, is there a specific time I'm supposed to be logging in? Cause I'm logging in and there's nobody there. Well, what it was, was he was just logging into classrooms at random times. So 
in the ideal world, hopefully this is from last year, but you know, eight introduction to agriculture, you know, the class description, but on the section line, you know, class time, eight, a seven 30, whatever Aaron anding mine this year says eight 30 to the eight 40 to nine 30 every day, Monday, you know, make it so that there's no debate when they look at the banner, they're going to see exactly what it is. So notice on each scenario where it says class time, a days, you know, obviously that's not the case anymore, but there's no denying when your class meets, if they're looking at the square, whether they're looking at it in the classroom or in the square, you are preventing time confusion. You're giving them notice of when they need to be there. There's no denying what should be going on. Uh, remember to add your co-teachers. So at our school, um, as moment, as soon as you have the classroom open, please make sure that you're adding your administration so that they can get in. Um, any deans or you know disciplinary people or someone who does a lot of communication with your students from your grade level, and any teachers you co-teach with. Um, I've been added before. Sometimes I'm added for a few you know a few days. Sometimes I added for a whole semester. Uh, but immediately invite your administration, co-teachers, anybody who needs to get into your classroom. Okay, it's their job to then accept but you've invited them so that they have access to your world as well. So what does this look like? We talked about this at the beginning of the semester. Um, I need for you to send the correct, you know, to be good with communication. When you send the invite, this is an invite that is not only been correctly sent out, but it has been accepted. And we know that for two reasons. We know you know, where it says correct, invite accepted, notice the color. If a invitation that you send out to people is gray, that's an invited person. They accept your invitation when it becomes color. Okay. Now, problem. We had a lot of people who think that they've sent out an invitation and they haven't. Now, this is an sent out invitation. It says invited and it is gray. But once it was sent out, the reason we know it's wrong is it still looks like an email. Okay. And that could be for any host of reasons. In this case, definitely the fact that there's no G for .org. Also, this is a made up username. But if it looks like an email after you sent out the invitation and underneath it, it says invited like this one, this is wrong. You need to delete it and redo. You know you have sent the invitation out right if it's gray and it has the word invited underneath it and it has switched to their profile picture with their legal name. That's when you know the invitation went out correctly. Okay, this is for both teachers and for students. You want to see a name, you want to see a profile picture, you want to see the word invited in gray and then hopefully in a few minutes or a few hours you will see the color version where they had accepted. Okay. Like I said, don't forget to do the same for students. It is their um, username to log into a desktop. This part doesn't change. The main thing about it is this right here. Yes, I do still sometimes put in the teacher share drive in the folder, but that is really not where I'm going at this point because that's just not what you should be doing. It's not the most up to date thing. Every single person, and I need you to bookmark this. I need to get this through everybody's head. Okay. I'm not going to be thinking too much about this. I'll do it occasionally, but that is not where it is because I know that every single one of you have access to this both on campus and at home. Okay. HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash INS dot EBR schools dot net forward slash stubs. Okay. Stubs is for their uh, student blah, 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 password system. This is the part here is what I have access to because this is everything, including teachers. But when you add the stubs part to it, every faculty member in EBR now has access to that and you will get their username, their passwords, their emails. You'll also get, by the way, as an update, um, a memorandum of understanding was written between um, our library system and the public library system. And now our kids all have digital library cards through the East Baton Rouge Parish Public Library System. You can find that when you download the CSV uh, file, which we can give the kids so they have access to all those resources. Um, 
I need everybody to understand that Stubbs is where they need to go. You do not need to send a student to me for their username and password. You have access 24 seven and is the most up to date. If it's not in Stubbs, it doesn't exist. Okay. So there you go for inviting your students. Uh, please then think about your classroom settings. Okay. Just like you want to put up everything you need to figure out the flow of your physical classroom. You need to figure out the flow of your uh, classroom online and you use the little gear settings some things to consider. Um, I know we're using Google codes this year. Last year, we said the district actually mandated that you had to stop using codes. That was a district policy. Um, manage invite codes, turn off. I personally will never use codes again. Um, they type them wrong. They lose them. You're waiting for them to handle something. I just invite my students. Um, the invitation is there. I know it went out correctly. I know it's now on them to you know do it. I leave that up to you, but I personally have mine turned off the only way. And it says that on my syllabus, you will only get this when I invite you. That's up to you. But we did have problems in the district with people using those and hopping into classrooms, even across the district and causing disruptions. If you turn off managed invite codes, you are the only one who can invite people to your classroom when it comes to students. Uh, please think about your stream. Your stream, the default is actually the um, most open. It allows students to comment and post on your stream. If that's not what you want, you need to go set up your stream as to how much access you want the kids to be able to post on your Google stream. Determine your notifications. Um, how often do you want to be notified about things by email? Uh, most likely deleted items. Keep that turned off because that just becomes an issue. I'm um, showing deleted items. Uh, turn on guardian summaries. You can invite parents to be guardians on a Google Classroom. And if you turn on guardian summaries, we know that they can do that. Remember, this is from um, last spring when we were using Google Meets. We're not really doing that very much now, but obviously if we had to go back to that, you need to make sure that you have the ability to generate a Meet link that the kids can use to see you during class. Okay? And remember, you're only turning on when you're actually using it. Take that Meet off. They like to click into it and then sometimes either they keep thinking that they're going in and out and someone's not waiting for them to turn it off, lock it out from them if it's not something that they need. So, for example, stream, students can notice, and notice the default setting. Students can post and comment is the actual default and that's the most open. Okay, figure out what you want here so that you can have your classroom settings, which will help with communication and prioritizing. Okay, and, you know, showing deleted items. Why do they need to see an item that you delete? That's, that's of no help to them. It was deleted, but they can still see it if you let them see it. Just don't let them see it. Okay. Classroom settings continued. Under grading, you'll probably want to keep it to no overall grade unless you really know what you're doing with, you know, percentages and things of that nature. Um, Ms. Everson actually caught on to this one in a couple of the science people, I think, and a few others. Um, grade categories. You can always change the default grade for an assignment when you make the assignment, but I really want you to go in and make grade categories, quiz, project, report. Think about what you put on your syllabus this fall where you said that this was you know, 25% and this was 15%. What were those words? Those should be a grade category with some kind of point value. You can always change the point value, but I want it under grade categories for a specific reason. So notice, I went in and did grade categories and I said that, you know, a classroom test was 100 points and a quiz is 50. That can always be changed when you make an individual assignment. But look why it's so important. If you have a grade assignment, you know, you can have it labeled. So now a kid knows, oh, this is a test. This is a quiz. This is a, you know, a bell ringer. Um, you've labeled it, you've given it a topic, you know, a tag of some kind. So now they can prioritize if they're down to the wire, what should I do? Should I do the test or should I do the bell ringer? Well, obviously you're probably going to want to do the test. Okay. Help them to prioritize. Now, possible other best practices as we get going. Uh, a lot of our teachers, I now do it still and several other people I've already caught doing it this year, but, um, Several people started making Google slide decks. Okay, I have one in my computer science classroom right now. And that Google slide deck is effectively your bulletin board. Okay, especially if we have to pivot into, you know, hybrid of some kind. 
if you have a slide deck where every day one slide is effectively that board with your objective, your bell ringer, your exit ticket, your homework, etc. And then, you know, the next day you just add another slide and you put that in your Google Classroom. There is a standing record of what went on in your room every day, which will help kids who were you know, absent. Um, if you need documentation, what was going on that day? It's the thing that when you open up, if we have to go to a Google Meet again, for some reason, when you open up a Google Meet, it's the first thing they see. So they immediately know what to do with their bell ringer. Um, it's your bulletin board. And so a lot of people uh, did this. So, and then they would put it under some category like housekeeping. This year I'm calling mine essential documents. It's the very first thing. So here's your daily objectives, you know, and bell ringers. Think of the communication and the time management that you're saving that, you know, immediately, if we ever had to go back to a Google Meet, this was up. They could start their bell ringer immediately, even in the virtual world. And then you have a record of what was going on. Um, also, instead of having to individually put this stuff in every day, you have one slide deck that's holding your entire nine weeks. Okay. So um, that's one way. And actually, if I escape, this is the one I'm doing right now. So survey of computer science daily boards. But you notice each day, if you look on the side, there it goes. Mine happen to be color coded. So they know that red is the first week, orange is the second week, it's where you move. Uh, there's yellow. So my kids yesterday realized that they were on week three. Um, and they looked at me in surprise when they realized that we had two weeks before progress reports were due from me. But they know that because I'm doing the colors, they see it every day and they know what's going on. Okay, so lots of ways you can use it. But this is sitting in the Google Classroom for this uh, nine weeks. They can go back to it whenever they want. Okay. Um, another thing that other people have found helpful as, like remember what I said, one reason to archive um, at the end of the night, we said you just have so much stuff in the Google Classroom, but you don't want to necessarily delete it because that's actually your record of what happened in your classroom. So a lot of people started realizing that making a hyperdoc for all of a unit's materials, rather than having material, 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 they were creating hyperdocs with links. Okay. And once that Google Doc with that hyperdoc, which with that hyperlink was in the classroom, they could keep updating it. So then there was only one piece of paper, quote unquote, that we were sending people back to, okay? It's provided as a material, and it's just one thing with all your resources in one place for the unit. So for example, I made one here. So I'm pretending I was doing an ag class. Not that I know what I'm doing in that, but you know, unit one is home gardening. So look here, unit one resources hyperdoc, okay? And so here's, you know, some resources, and there's a hyperlink. And, you know, throughout the, you know, unit, if I want to add another link, I just go to the Google Doc. I add the link. That's being updated onto what is in the Google Classroom. Okay, so think about the communication and how you're uh, putting it all in one place, making it very simple. It's not nearly as cluttered as your Google Classroom because everything is now on one document instead of 25. Um, this thing here. On the classwork tab of Google Classroom is called a topic. Okay, now to make a topic, you at least have to have one assignment underneath it. So you can't just make a topic and not have anything underneath it. But once you have an assignment, you know, an activity, an assignment, a material, something that can go under it, you now can make a topic. Okay, uh, topics are extremely important because what a topic does is it takes the the page called classwork and it organizes it, okay? So this um, right here is mine for this nine weeks. I will compare this to what I was saying on the other side. I forgot to pull this up. So here are my topics for my 
you know, Google Classroom this nine weeks. And, you know, essential documents are the things I need them to, you know, go back to time and time again. Uh, I could have it as this. I could have also done it as a hyperdoc. You know, it's up to you. But I've got one for bell ringers because I don't want them to do any. I just want them to go to get the bell ringers. I have one for exit tickets because I don't want them to debate. Bonus. Items for unit one creativity. And then I have a series for technology support, things to help them, you know, better use their Chromebook and stuff. That's me. That's not how you have to do yours. But what you do need to do is remember to use broad but specific topics, okay? So topics should be used for things such as units or maybe bell ringers, you know, categories. Think of it as categories. And I really want you to think, how do you organize information on your syllabus? How do you talk to your students? So are you someone who... Um, because everything can only get one topic tag. You can't add multiple. So how do you talk to students? So if a kid was absent for a week and they came back and said, you know, Mr. So-and-so, what did I miss? Um, are you going to tell them, well, you missed stuff in Unit 2? You know, look at Unit 2. Are you going to say you missed stuff related to the American Revolution? Are you going to say you missed stuff from, you know, Week 1? Are you going to say you missed stuff from this date to this date? However you do it, set up your topics the same way. Okay, um, and be consistent. If you're a unit person, be a unit person. If you're a bell ringer, as a ticket assignment person, report, do that. However you do it, be consistent. And consider a tag for things like housekeeping, whether you call it essential documents, housekeeping, bulletin board, um, FYI. Have a place where they know to get all their main things, okay? So what does it look like, you know, when you start working on the classwork tab and, you know, you're putting something there at the top is called topics. Here are my topics. They create them. You can move them any way you want. You can change what's underneath them. But think about the communication and time confusion. You know, I have one called bell ringer because I don't want them to look. I just want them to go straight to the bell ringer. You walk in, bell ringer, boom, go. You're leaving. Look at the exit ticket, boom, leave, okay? Please, 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 please. Every assignment must have a due date. I don't care if you don't care about the due date, but give it a due date because of the way our students think. Okay, we learned that our students tend to define their classwork under the upcoming section, the to do, and or they never even clicked into the classroom and just looked at that classroom box when you have all the boxes next to each other. If you don't have a due date, nothing shows up in upcoming and in the classroom box. It'll show up in the to-do, but it won't show up in upcoming, and it won't show up in the classroom box. So if you have a kid who only looks at the classroom box, he never thinks he has anything to do. I had a kid once sit in my library and go, I said, well, do some work. I don't have anything in this class. There isn't anything. I said, prove it. I made him get out of his Google Classroom. When he went to the Classworks page, he saw like 15 assignments in his eyes when his biggest saucers. He said, but there was nothing in the box. And he was right. The teacher had never given a due date. You know, it's his fault for not looking at the classwork page, but the teacher never gave him a due date, so when he looked at the box, nothing was due. And for him, that was enough. Um, it also means it could be a due date that it shows up in the classroom calendar. Your class has a classroom calendar, and the kids have access to it. Okay? Um, use it. Okay, so notice what I'm saying. Here is the box without a due date. Here is the box with a due date. Under upcoming, no work due soon. All of a sudden, something's there because there's a due date. Okay, and I kind of said this. Remember, it's important enough for you to assign it. It's probably important enough to give a deadline. However you treat the deadline, but give it a deadline. Okay. Uh, promote the Google Classroom calendar. You know, our kids aren't carrying planners, but they are carrying one through the Google Classroom calendars. You know, promote it. Assignments with deadlines are automatically added to the Google Classroom calendar. Show students how to manipulate their Google Classrooms. It's a digital planner. It's a planner for 2021. Show them how to use it, okay? You can embed the calendars into your Google Sites. Our teachers are supposed to have a Google Site that I can link to the website as a general rule. 
if we work your calendar right and vet it, parents can now see everything, even if they're not a guardian. Okay? So, for example, with a due date, there it is. Okay? You can find your Google Classroom, you know, up here with the Meet Class Drive folder. By the way, everything in a Google Classroom is really being saved in a Classroom Drive folder. Right there, Google Calendar. Okay? Think about the reduction in communication, time consuming, uh, confusion, and of course, because this is now actually their planner, whether they know it or not, prioritizing. Um, make use when you of uh, the make a copy for each student whenever possible. Okay, so when you make an assignment and you attach, you know, a Google Doc, you can do it as like a view only. You can make every kid an editor watch that one. It's great if you all want them collaborating on one document, but if not, it's not good. But the make a copy for each student really helps them and you. Okay, by creating a copy of an assignment for each student, you will promote the following. You'll provide documentation if a student has gotten an assignment slash started it. Okay, it's going to give a timestamp. You can set up the document format for how you want it to look. A lot of teachers are like, oh my gosh, the kids are typing in like size 22 pink font. But if you set it up ahead of time, You've given them the format. Okay, we'll have something to look at even if they don't turn it in correctly. So even if they never turn it in, since you gave them the copy and they typed on it, you can still go look. Okay? And it may be able to, you may be able to work with a student on the assignment. Um, I know all my kids who type at like 3 in the morning because that's when I'm usually grading papers or doing things. And they're on the assignment at 3 a.m. and I'm on it with them and we're communicating back and forth. Okay, you can do that with make a copy. Um, and when I said uh, it, it will help with a variety of technology issues while also providing documentation of whether or not a student got the assignment work on it. Um, this right here, um, a lot of us discovered that in Google Docs, they have one called Report MLA. And last year, a bunch of us on the high school side love to see more of us. We all committed to the idea that this is what we would use because now there is no more typing in size 22 pink font. We established the format for you. It looks more professional, made citing their evidence uh, easier with because it has a work cited page. It had a heading. There was no debate. You just start typing. Um, and a lot of the kids actually responded really favorably to it because they didn't have to think either. They could just start working. Okay. Um, so what does all of this look like when put together? You know, so I'm making an assignment. I'm going to give it a title, give it some instructions, you know, type a three to four paragraph, whatever. How to properly compose Kitchen Scraps essay. Okay, notice if you really look at it, I'm using the report MLA format. So there is no debate. They're going to get it exactly how I want it, time size 12, you know, double spaced. I'm hitting make a copy for each student. It's for, you know, a class. You can either do it by class or by students. So if you have to, you know, differentiate, you can give it to everybody, you know, or not everybody. Grade category, this is a project. Whether I want it to be worth 100 points, if that's the default, I can change it. I got a due date, I can give it a timestamp too. I gave it a topic, it's gonna to go in unit one. If I wanna give a rubric, you can add a rubric. You can actually do um, an originality report to see if what they're giving you is plagiarism. Here's what's really cool, you can do an assign, schedule, or save draft. So you could save the draft because you're not done with it, Assigning means it immediately goes in the Google stream, or you can schedule it. So if you don't want them to see it till 9 a.m. on Friday, you can schedule that, okay? Another thing, send individual messages to students through the classroom stream instead of through Gmail. Um, if they have not set up their Gmail correctly, that's another video I got, uh, they can send out, but they can't get in. So anything you're sending to them, they can't get. So unless you know they set up their Gmail correctly, that's not your best avenue. Um, we had a lot of issues. It says avoid the many issues with student email uh, by using the Google Classroom stream. I use the stream a lot um, for general announcements, but I really also use it for individual, like um, this week I did the BR Byte student codes. So sending each student individually their code, they permanently have it in their stream. So in case they forget it, they just have to scroll down. Um, notice here in the stream, 
I can do all students. This class didn't have any kids because it's a made up class, but if there had been kids, I could click one, I could click five, I could click whatever. Now, that was a lot of info. It's a lot of listening to Miss Andy talk, and yes, I know I can talk, but you know, that was a lot. What I really need you to think about is which practices will best promote, you know, will promote the best student experience and then use those. If something I said didn't work for you, don't do it because you obviously can't um, follow through. There are some that should probably be almost non-negotiables. Uh, have a due date on an assignment. Others, you know, might be more about your interests, but think about the experience from both your side and their side, okay? Um, obviously, this presentation was made in the virtual world, but we're still kind of there in the relationship to homework and weekends. The kids are carrying the Chromebooks 24-7. They are with, away from you more than they're with you. We never know if something's going to happen and we need to change fast. So having your room set up for the idea of that certainly can't hurt you right now and would only help you if we had to make that transition extremely fast. Okay. Um, I am available in the library. I do have a YouTube channel. Um, it's this picture. Uh, it's Aaron Anding. Please subscribe. I'll put this video up there in case you need to see it again. Um, this is actually from last spring, but if you use it there and, you know, I get the ability to give you some CLUs, I can go back to this and give it to you. So that's still perfectly fine. And thank you very much. Uh, email is emurray with an A in it. Anding is for A at ebrschools.org or come find me in the library. Thank you so much.